It looks like Matt, you're the host now, and you got the recording started. Yes. Yep, got it. All right. So, Victor. Uh, Seems like um, Lars has a question before. Oh yeah, some some little deep breath from DevCon would be would be awesome too. Oh, way cool. Yeah, yeah. And if we could just say what the, the just the time code for this, the, what call this is for the recording. Yeah, so this is the uh, IPFS all hands. Take it away. All right. So I guess uh, we start off with the uh, Catalonia. Yeah. So uh, we uh, a couple of us from IPFS has been at uh, DevCon. Uh, I think maybe Jeremy could give an overview of DevCon in general at one point uh, later today. But what I what I wanted to share is that we had uh, a specific event uh, a couple of days ago after DevCon, where we talked specifically about how these different uh, decentralized technologies can help with uh, censorship and other things specifically in Catalonia and trying to come up with solutions that could help uh, today. Uh, I think the event ended up being 100 people, more or less. There was a, a huge interest in trying to come up with solutions, which was uh, very cool to see. Uh, and we split up into smaller groups, uh, maybe 10, 15 people in each group. And I was leading a group with uh, focused on how IPFS can help uh, with censorship things, and um, we came up. We we pretty much quickly established that IPFS is is ready to be used. Uh, the the anonymity could be better, uh, but it's it's well enough for now. The biggest problem comes on how to discover content and where to discover the content from. So to be able to offline share hashes with pen and paper or pass around USB sticks and give tools to replicate these USB sticks, and also leverage the existing mesh networks uh, that exist in Catalonia today, Wi-Fi, which I think is the second biggest mesh network in the world uh, right now. So we came up with uh, some, some ideas of how we can move forward with this, uh, but it would be great if we could come up with some more ideas on how to offline share hashes and tools that we can use in the future. Cool. And is that the mesh network? Is that different uh, from? I know, Laura. I just yesterday someone came into my news feed about mesh networks uh, for, and, and that I actually look, turns out Laura is actually you've been involved in this mesh network. And is that different for a uh, mesh network Wi-Fi? Or is the for the, from the protocol level, level layer two, or is it actually like um, IPFS uh, fueling the the content on top of the, the the hardware mesh network? Yeah, so Gwifi is is working by by antennas that you point to peers, and then you peer peer with antennas, and IPFS would just be used to be able to pass around the content. And we also have been working with the Gwifi, or we are starting to work now with Gwifi peop, uh, people to build a distributed DNS uh, service for their internal network as well. So me and Lars met with them in the hack day that was a couple of weeks ago where we talked with Gwifi people. And they, they mainly want to use IPFS to pass around content, host websites, and to distribute DNS records internally on their private network. Uh, so what's missing is, is a relay. So the circuit relay we're working on, so they can connect the internal nodes to the outside network, IPFS network, and then just building this DNS service. And then we can start thinking about other things to use IPFS for in their network. Cool. And I think there's also the issue about the, the takedown of, of the gateways. And so can you just recap what the issue was and what the workaround was? Yeah, so the uh, IPFS, the, there was a website of the referendum on where to ha vote, how to vote, how you can be an observer in the referendum to happen. 
and some other details about the election. It was quickly censored by the Spanish government, and eventually the Spanish government took control over the .cat, which is our local uh, top-level domain. So people started mirroring the website on different domains, and the Spanish government continued to, to block other domains on the ISP level. And then eventually, I think it was the Pirate Party here in, in Catalonia who put the website on IPFS. And the Catalan president tweeted a link to this website, and it was quickly blocked as well, uh, the DNS of our full gateways, which also meant that other things uh, were blocked as well. It was just all, the gateways were blocked, not just the website. Gotcha. So any other uh, update from uh, DEFCON? Well, before we move from that, uh, Victor, you said you guys decided that anonymity is sufficient. Could you say more about what you mean by that and what you don't mean by that? Yeah, so currently the when you are pinning content or when you're adding content to IPFS, we kind of share that with the other nodes. Uh, so it's kind of obvious which content you are adding and things like that and people were a bit worried that you wouldn't be able it would be easy to sniff and figure out who is hosting what content and also the lack of an audited uh, tour transport put some people off as well so given those concerns what what led people to say that the anonymity was sufficient it was insufficient because when you are adding uh, content okay. yeah when you're adding content we share what content you add to the nearby nodes so it will be easy for other people to see what you're doing even though maybe you didn't mean it okay thank you so any other uh, updates from defcon Maybe Jeremy wants to speak a bit about that. Yeah, so we had a lot of stuff happen at DevCon. The most exciting, in my opinion, is that I had several conversations with different groups about using the P2P. Uh, in particular, the, um, the Go Ethereum devs and the uh, Parity Ethereum devs are interested in moving forward with integrating with P2P into their Ethereum clients and then starting to run uh, Whisper first and then moving towards other protocols over that. So this will be really exciting. Uh, yeah, if we get the P2P integrated into Ethereum, at the best in Ethereum, we should learn much more easily. Um, past that, I talked to a few other different blockchain groups, and they were also all really excited, especially the ones who were writing something go. Um, they're like, oh, we'll have to look at that. That'd be really cool. Um, and so hopefully there's a lot of uh, increased interest in that soon. Yeah. Cool. So any other uh, things on the agenda before we d dive into uh, demos? There's uh, David just popped online. Give uh, David a chance if you wanted to. Hey. Um, <laughs> So uh, one thing that we were going to talk about with the uh, for um, demos was the uh, JS uh, IPFS is working on Safari, which I saw be posted on uh, Twitter. So I asked someone to give a demo, and so I think uh, Victor had uh, volunteered to discuss it. But actually, if someone has Safari, David, if you have Safari running, I should be great to. Uh... Um, yeah, so I can show it working on desktop on mobile. Let me just open an app to make that example and and so all right sorry i just i feel i'm like in a controlled crash playing mode here where i just like <laughs> jumped in the meeting and now i'm like right <laughs> you're on <laughs> ready to go <laughs> yeah good uh so so yeah um let me show safari Sorry, in one of my many tabs. All right, oh, I think we just broke our record. This is, we now have the most people. I think 21 was the most we ever had. Now we have 22. All right.
So do you see my screen? Yeah, I guess you do. Yep. That's awesome. So yeah, like this is Safari. If you're not familiar with this window, um, this is PeerPad. So it's a thing that we released recently. Uh, we released it most fast, so it's still in alpha. We haven't audited the code base. Uh, so um, the idea is to make a fully peer-to-peer, -peer, private, encrypted, and collaborative uh, doc editing tool. You can use it today, but until it's fully audited by security specialists and like that ensure that the code is sound and the implementation is sound, uh, I would not advise you to use it for any sensitive information. But you can now go to peerpad.net um, and yeah, and click the start button to create one pad. And if you do that, it gives you like this nice like markdown. You can like control the views here, uh, and you can all write. My mouse not working. Okay. Yeah, I think there's a bug in PeerPad. I've seen the same behavior the other day. Oh, Wait, interesting. Just type. Uh, but I've seen it in Firefox on Linux. So okay, okay. Now I can I'm able to type. So and you see that it says online. Uh, so if you go to the JavaScript console, can you still see the JavaScript console? Yep. All right. So before you would see a bunch of errors here. Um, it would say, or oh, something with Web Crypto was not there, or something with WebRTC was not there. But now, uh, this is like a stream ended prematurely. It's just a connection that was closed. That's fine. Um, but, but like, there is no error. So you can open the same link. And now I'm going to stop screen sharing to then jump to my camera. So I'm going to open that same link to my phone. All right, um, let me open it here. All right, so just connected. And so you can see in my phone, like I have the letters I type there and I can go to my browser again and say, Um, sorry. Desktop. Can, can you see how yep. it changed? Yeah, nice. All right. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, All right. So yeah, this is Safari Mobile uh, working. So, and I don't have an Android phone working because mine broke. But if someone has an Android phone and wants to show their Android phone like holding the same path, it should work on Chrome. Um, as well, I, I'll post here the link. Yeah, if someone has an Android phone, that'd be great. How about uh, so? This is an update in Safari to enable Web Crypto, or is this would update in JS IPFS? Uh, yeah, it was pretty much an update on Safari. So Safari, basically, the, the Safari team, the WebKit team, has been, have been working on WebRTC, and apparently, they not only implemented WebRTC, they also implemented the rest of the Web Crypto primitives that were missing. And we just happened to discover it by surprise during MozFest because someone grabs an iPhone and tested it on their mobile <laughs> device. And they're like, oh, sorry, that's not going to work. And then it worked. Nice. <laughs> and then that's when we realized, oh, it also works on the desktop. <laughs> so that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Uh, that's a <laughs> longer URL. Yeah, that's true for real. You have to copy the whole thing and open it on... Um, open it on... Yeah, your Android device on Chrome. What's the second hash? It's like markdown slash a hash slash another hash? Yeah, so there is like two things that are being shared there. PeerPad has two modes. One is like read-only, another one is write uh, plus read. So to have the read-only mode, you just need a key to decrypt the messages that go through the pub sub channel. So that, that's why it's private. Like you need to have a key to have access to the messages of the room. Otherwise you just receive random blobs of data. And then in order for you to be able to write, the mechanism to give permission to write in PeerPad is that you sign the messages 
with the key of the pet itself. So you have like this public uh, private key pair that all the other nodes will um, try to sign the messages that they write with. Oh, there you go. Jeremy is showing it. Sweet. <laughs> um, so I. Oh, cool. A from an Nigeria world. Okay. All right. Uh, and there's more nice. people <laughs> joining. So, so I, as I was explaining, there is a key for signing the messages, and a, and a peer path instance will only accept the messages that it can validate the signature, and it will only take those messages and add it to the CRDT, and then like if everything checks out, then um, it creates a new state locally, and then injects that new state into the the viewer into the editor. So if you don't have the right key, so the signing key, you can still view if you have the decrypt key, but you cannot, you, the other peers will never accept them, your messages because they will consider it them invalid. Did I manage to like explain any, any questions on this? Does this make sense? Cool. Maybe we lost Matt. Okay. So I think, uh, so, uh, no, um, I, I had a demo working with uh, PubSub Room. Um, I think it was Hector's work uh, with the IPID spec that I, bu that I built for the D, uh, DID on top of IPFS. So that still isn't working. And so I'm, I'm thinking, uh, and it's still, uh, I think the web crypto shim um, file is, is still acting up in Safari. Uh, it works fine in, in Chrome. And so I think is there... Um, is the same libraries being used in PubSub Room? Does anyone know? Yeah, so it should be like, so PRPAD also uses PubSub Room. So what might be happening uh, is one of two things, um, or you don't have the latest Safari version in your, in your uh, machine, or you have some old dependency of the peer-to-peer stack of modules and because you might be installing with npm5 you have like this package lock or if you are using yarn you have like this lock file and, and so my advice to for you to try is just remove that lock file remove the and no modules folder and install everything again and it should work all right all right that's ex exactly was my thought it was actually i have some dependency that i haven't updated um in that in the in the library that i built and so i think i'll try mm -hmm. again because i think it opens up a huge number of possibilities for uh WebRTC, it's super cool. Sweet. So a lot of people are having trouble getting this to load. Is that because they have old versions of the browsers and so web crypto is not working? Is it working for me on the SSH? Is this a little fresh peer path? Um, I know I, I had to cool. download, I had to quit and, and reinstall Safari. So it was uh, Safari version 11.0.1 um, that worked for me. Let me see which version. Last week. It could just also be slow to like establish the connection to the nodes who have the content. It can take a while in the beginning. So I have this version here. Um, yeah, if it's not working for you on Chrome, uh, and I can see any error on the console log, please like open an issue for us. Um, yeah, like still alpha. So thank you for testing it out. Uh, and, and yeah, there's like some things that are still rough, especially like if you open multiple tabs. So that, that's like a known bug and like a hard thing to handle. If you open multiple tabs, we had two options or we would create multiple IPFS nodes or we would try to use one node and have the other tabs synchronized through the um, index DB itself. And so we are trying to do that. So like instead of like opening multiple nodes, so multiple nodes creating a DHT presence, uh, we only do one. And, and then we try to use one node to proxy all the requests through all the pop subs. Uh, and that's kind of hard. So if you are trying peer path for optimal uh, usage, try with just one tab right now, not multiple. All right, cool. Uh, any other questions about PeerPad? One thing to flag there, uh, David, right now, if I open up PeerPad and I 
fill it in with information. Is that data being stored on peerpad.net or is it only stored in my browser? Uh, just store in your browser and all the other browsers that you share that URL. We don't have any pinning service attached to PeerPad right now that stores the data for you. Uh, also, if we end up doing that, we will only store the encrypted blobs. So like, no other service will actually be able to like, see the data that you're storing. Everything will be encrypted. And so it will always require you to provide a key in order to like, see what was the content of the path. Which brings up a topic that's very relevant for our next demo. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So should we next uh, is the data together. So is that Matt or you or B5? Brendan. I, uh, I think I'll, I'll, I'll take it if it's cool. Um, okay. Can everyone hear me okay? Yep. Cool. Yeah. Um, so we've been working a little bit over a data together on some of this <clears throat> archival work. And uh, today I wanted to demo something pretty quick. It's, uh, uh, calling this an alpha would be a stretch. It's a proof of concept at most, but um, trying to uh, get uh, the work specification to work properly with um, sort of IPFS hash structures. Um, and so, yeah, if you don't mind, I'll share my screen. We'll see what's going on here. Um, so yeah, can everybody see this okay? Hopefully that's working. Yep. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, so this is a really quick command line tool uh, that we've made. The repo is linked. <laughs> it's called DT for now, uh, data together for short. Uh, it only has one command, which is archive, but uh, basically what you can do is give it two URLs and uh, hit archive, and what this will do is it'll go and grab um, the URLs in question, but then also do a lot of the things that the work specification asks you to do which is basically grab any dependent resources of that given web page. Um, it'll pull all that in. It'll rewrite all of the um, URLs to, uh, to look the way they should. And then uh, it'll give you back a hash that is sort of date stamped with some archival stuff. We'll wait for this to spin up. And hopefully, with any luck, it will actually show a uh, quick sort of reference of the archive. So we get the actual date of ingest. Um, and then the URLs that we archived. And then clicking this, um, if it works properly, you can actually see the style sheets. Um, and then same thing with this thing. Um, things like videos. This is uh, Mr. Zumwalt's wonderful uh, lib, uh, code for lib talk is obviously not included. Um, so this is a, like a very early version, but just focusing on sort of getting some basics um, in place. But uh, yeah, it's kind of a quick demo of what's going on. Um, so we're, we're using this a bunch in the context of trying to archive government data and try to get um, clean, consistent archives of URLs and to be able to sort of deduplicate them. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of stuff in here, but I'm hoping to sort of just draw everybody's attention to this. And uh, if you have any uh, interest, you can join us over on the Data Together uh, repos to kind of try this through. And yeah, I'll stop sharing there. Nice. Any questions? Okay, nice. There we go. Is, yeah. is this is the source for this? I missed a bit, but is the source for this available somewhere? To it is. Yeah. Playing Everything's over at the Data Together organization. I put a note in the um, in the actual HackMD uh, file for the for the meeting minutes. But yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, it's super early, but a couple of. I wanted to sort of uh, get a conversation going about a couple of key things, like the way that the pathing works. Um, I really want to be able to have the rewrite of those URLs sort of match so that. Um, multiple iterations, multiple archives of the same thing will result in the same hash. And so rewriting the URLs to all be relative to the root of the hash, but also using the domain name as sort of the folder, the top level folder seems to be uh, a good starting point, but I'm not totally sure that that will get clean, consistent deduplicating records. There's a lot of work to be done there. Um, there's a lot of work to be done in general, but, oh, I should have demoed the other thing. You can actually, uh, so that archive actually writes everything required to satisfy a work file which is, um, uh, I don't know if everybody's seen what forks do, but they, people use them often like in the court of law, and eventually we could, the next thing to build here is to get a export to a work file um, that will match the sort of work specifications that will work in the Wayback Machine and, and other sort of things. But I thought it was pretty important that the actual content of the archive should display on IPFS natively, and so that's sort of a lot of the work. Could you tell how this relates with the interplanetary wayback work that people have 
Yeah, um, so uh, um, Matt Kelly from Old Dominion University is a reviewer on this, and so hopefully we'll be able to get him and Ilya Kramer, who works on the Web Reporter, to also sort of chime in and help us sort of work through how to get good interoperability with the existing uh, IPWB and uh, Wayback Machine tools, or IWB tools. And it's not just speaking to, this work is not just about archiving web pages, but as Brendan sort of referenced, it's also about archiving data sets and using a lot of these archival principles that were developed for archiving web pages and applying that those same structures to data sets that are archived on that data uh, Something I want to call out with this is, which this is why this is relevant to the peer chat demo. Very that would be um, the, so what's relevant to the PeerPad demo is that with, when you have content on IPFS, then you need to figure out which node should be holding the content. And so when you apply that with an idea of something that's a collective asset, so whether that's a government data set or if it's a PeerPad that was collaboratively edited by three people from the same company, you need to figure out where you're going to pin that stuff and who gets to decide what gets pinned and where. And so this is where Data Together is this kind of side project that's trying to tackle that more in general and tackle those problems as how they apply to the decentralized web in general, not just IPFS. So we happen to be building tooling like what Brendan's showing that is doing this with IPFS tools, but it's also something that just applies in general with any content that's stored using distributed systems or decentralized systems. Cool. And then what about uh, the metadata associated with the, the archiving? So like when, when it was ha uh, hashed, uh, what specific domain was it? So is there a structure for representing that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so currently it's all being written into a work file, uh, which actually exists at the root of the archive, which keeps all of, and that's written in accordance with the work spec. Um, the last, the next thing to ship is to actually pull the body of the work out and just reference the hash um, of the actual block on IPFS. Um, so as of right now, you're getting duplicate writing, so I wouldn't recommend this as like a use today tool. Um, but in the future, we'll sort of make it so it just references the hash and, and instead of the actual body. And that's actually the model is built into is a Word file. Yeah, it's, Word. It's a, it's Word. An ISO Web archive. Yeah. Web archive. Sorry. It's an ISO specification. It's really, really old. Back from the day when they used character return new line as like a way of delimiting things. <laughs> but yeah. So it's the nice thing is it does give you everything you need to understand sort of what came from that. Um, there is a, a bit of a privacy concern there though as well because the work spec does request that you record your IP address when you do the archiving. So I think there's an interesting question there about what to do in the context of a uh, privacy-oriented framework. Gotcha. Any other questions about it? Well, super cool. Uh, do we have anything else on the agenda today? I think we had another demo from someone that was added, no? Uh, so, some stuff. Uh, I just added some stuff and Jeremy also added one item. Um, there are quick things, just like uh, announcements, making sure everyone is on the loop. Um, should I go? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, cool. So um, three things. Uh, one of them is, so you saw the demo of PeerPad. Uh, as I said, like we were at this conference, um, MozFest in London for a weekend and we spent um, like two days there, like we had a bunch of sessions, there were a bunch of discussions, um, a bunch of those will be converted to blog posts that we will then publish for everyone to see. But one of those sessions was actually a workshop. And for that workshop was explaining, teaching how to use CRDTs and IPFS to create apps like PeerPad. Um, and what we did was we created a, a repo called Peer-to-Peer -peer Flipchart, which helps you create a thing with the same CRDT library that uh, PeerPad is using, but to create a flip chart uh, on a web page. So you can like have your participatory meetings and everyone can have a flip chart to make drawings and take notes instead of using text. Uh, and so there is a slide deck uh, that I linked here on the notes, which has like, what was the workshop step by step. 
uh, we want to record it as a video as well. So it's easier, even easier to follow. But you can check the code today on gita.com, IPFS shipyard, peer-to-peer -peer chart, and see how it works. Um, it's, it's kind of like a simpler version of PeerPad because it doesn't have the crypto, it just has the syncing. So it, it's good to get started. The, the next thing is there has been a lot of development on Windows support for just a PFS. Uh, it is something that uh, the community just like appeared and started contributing. So Richard, uh, I'm not sure if he's here. Uh, well, he's from New Zealand, so completely different time zone. Um, has been like going module by module and enabling app layer and like running the tests on Windows and like fixing the, the, the things that were missing, especially on the data store layer to make sure that JSIPFS can run on Windows. So expect to have JSIPFS running on Windows by the next release, 027. And uh, last but not the least is something that I'm really excited about. So um, if you are used, like, so, by the way, if you have questions, raise your hand. Um, okay, so far so good. The last one um, is a new streaming and buffered API for JSIPFS. If you use JSIPFS in the past, uh, you typically uh, would consume like a file through a readable stream to a Node.js stream. And it gives you like nice properties like back pressure and it gives you like really nice APIs for piping into other things that were used to parse lots of data. The problem is the readable stream shim for the browser is kind of like very memory intensive, which is a problem. So uh, we started seeing users reporting that they were having trouble uh, troubles using um, our APIs to upload files of 300 megs and more. And, and yes, there were some performance issues, there are some things on the crypto land, but like after fixing those, one that was very evident was the, just the streaming library that we were using. Uh, and, and fun fact is like, we actually didn't use that streaming library on the internals because we already knew that like, it was not the best, not the most performant. It was just the more widely adopted. Uh, and so uh, what we did uh, and what we've been working on is creating a new API that exposes that same old streaming API. So like if you're, you're, you are used to Node.js streams, you can still use it. But if you are familiar with pull streams, uh, you can use pull streams directly, which is a thing that we use internally in JSX defense. Or if you don't want to think about streams at all, if you're just like handling with files like small files, less than a gig, you can just tell us to give you a buffer with a file and you get the file and you can use it. Uh, and so for a lot of developers, streams are still like a thing that's not natural. So I expect that a lot of people will be able to pick up on these APIs to like create more interesting applications like PFS because it removes like streams from the equation if you don't want them. Um, and that is something that I'm going to release on the next version as well, 027. It, it, there's already an implementation on JSFFS API, so that will, as tradition, we implement it always for JSFFS API and JSFFS, so that's like one single interface for both ends. And there is a, a pull request with a spec already defined, so if you want to review it and give feedback and see if you like it, uh, please do, and I will link it to the notes. Okay, and that's a specific uh, branch? Uh, it is a specific brand. It is a specific branch on JSAPFS API, and it is a specific branch on interface APFS core. Uh, I haven't opened the branch on JSAPFS yet, um, but it will be also a specific branch that. Well, uh, uh, if you are familiar with the process of developing things on JSLAN, we always have this like work in progress pull requests where we just like from the beginning, we open the pull request so that everyone is aware that like that work is happening. And when it's time to review, we just invite the reviewers and then when it's time to merge, we merge it and release it. So let me link here the pull request for the interface, which is where I would love to get your feedback. Um, so, all right. So just linked on line 64, the comments, you can see a pull request to interface IPFS core. Um, it has the spec and the tests. Um, let us know if we missed something or there is something you like to see there that's not there. All right, cool. Any other questions about it? All right, no, I guess, all right. So Jeremy, you're up with the next um, uh, IPFS release. Yeah, um, uh, 
<laughs> yeah, yeah so it's new uh, release candidate for 0.4.12. Um, it has a few fixes front that were uh, not present in 0.4 in the release, release candidate one. Uh, notably, the Badger uh, alternative data store experiment works a lot better now and actually builds on the platforms. So theoretically, that's the one to know, and you can use Badger and you shouldn't have to worry about it. Uh, but we're going to still call it experimental for another release cycle. But yeah, after that, we should have the actual release out pretty soon. And with connection closing and all these wonderful yeah, uh, There was a data corruption bug in Badger, so we want to hold off on that until we fix that. Yeah, so that's updating from the previous version of Badger to this version of Badger, right? No, there's a separate data corruption bug where someone kept killing their uh, their daemon, and eventually it couldn't recover. Ah, interesting. Okay, so yeah, experimental. And then just explain what is uh, Badger in the context of data store? Uh, yeah, so right now IPFS uses a combination of level DB and files on the disk in some tree to store all the data. Uh, it turns out storing files on disk is actually not that fast especially given all the different spells you have to make for different directories and syncing things and making directories and storing it a file for each block. Uh, the overhead for each file is actually non-zero. So Badger uses a single nmap. Sorry, is there streaming going on? Or is this okay? Yeah. Um, Badger uses a single nmap file and stores all the data in there very efficiently. So it's much, much, much faster and also should be more disk efficient than LATFS. And so we're hoping to switch to that as the default, but we're working out um, working out a few different kinks. Gotcha. Cool. So just to clarify, that means Badger replaces both LATFS and the level store. That is the idea right now. Um, we're going to probably do some different experiments with that. Uh, but yeah, we have uh, the, the new data store configuration model is actually really nice. So you can you can make it replace it all, or you can modify it yourself and still use LDB for the things that LDB was used for in the past. Um, it's yeah, the, the data store configuration is really nice now. You can make it work however you want it to. Cool. All right. Any other questions about it? All right, any other items? Yeah, uh, one question. Oh, here we go. Who is it? Uh, do you know when 0412 is going to be released? Uh, probably by the end of this week. Awesome, thanks. Yeah. OK, any other items on the agenda? Um, I, like the, I see there is a question from Sam Holmes here uh, on materials about CRDTs. Um, just wanted to point out that we have a repo called Research CRDT, and it's just like a collection of materials about CRDTs, talks, papers, blog posts, and also issues of things that people are like experimenting with right now on top of IPFS. So if you want like to learn about CRDTs, there's a lot of materials to get started there, or if you want to, to follow those discussions, um, they are typically a good point to, to start. All right, cool. No problem. All right, any other items? All right, so I move that we adjourn. Uh, Kex, if you could uh, add the, uh, whoever is good at the recording, um, please send it to Kex to add it in this to the notes. There is, a, there is another demo, I think. Oh, all right. All right, TensorFlow, is that it? Yes. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Okay, cool. Adam. Yes, hi. Hi, everybody. Um, I uh, wanted to give just a quick introduction to a project that isn't fully released yet, but seemed like a good opportunity to tell people about what, what was up with it. Um, and then we can go into more detail uh, if people are interested either offline or in another one of these calls. So. Um, for anyone not familiar with TensorFlow, 
Um, I'm going to turn on screen sharing. Share screen. Mm. Let's see. Oh, I'll do the full desktop. There we go. Okay, so can, can folks see my, my desktop? Yep. Okay, great. So TensorFlow is, an, is a, for those not familiar, it's a machine learning uh, framework and toolkit for um, the research community and for folks to be running machine learning in production. It's a very official Google project. Uh, they, they have a lot of resources on it. It's extremely extensible. Um, if people want more background on TensorFlow itself, it's probably a good use of uh, out-of-band communication. But the basic idea is researchers write papers uh, using TensorFlow. Um, they will publish their results, and they'll sometimes publish source code. And so they're running these models uh, and these uh, systems across terabytes of data, uh, across uh, either one machine that may cost tens of uh, $10,000 or dozens or hundreds or, in some cases, thousands of machines uh, churning through terabytes of data trying to train these models. So TensorFlow has an interface uh, that you can add file system implementations. And so they have actually five implementations of how to read and write data into TensorFlow. Um, POSIX, Hadoop, Google Cloud Storage, a memory math file system, and um, not written here, but there's also an S3 file system. So the, the interface for adding your own file system is C++. Um, so I spent a little while uh, combining IPFS and TensorFlow in making IPTF, that is interplanetary TensorFlow. Um, this implements that C++ uh, interface and then provides a uh, new URL scheme which I've gotten a little bit of feedback from the IPFS team. We haven't finished that discussion yet. But the premise is anything that you start with IPTF colon slash slash in TensorFlow actually jumps out to the uh, like IPFS uh, daemon and or network as appropriate. So I can offer a, a, a quick demo. Um, I just downloaded this random, um, I just downloaded this random project uh, off of GitHub that says, you know, download our thing and run uh, python.train.py. And so if I use, you guys can still see, correct? Yep. Okay, great. Uh, so here I've got, uh, this is that project. Sure, can you just zoom in a little bit? Zoom in. I can make fonts much like that. There you go. That. Perfect. Yeah. Um, okay, so in this case, uh, IPTF is the name of the binary I'm using. I'm telling it I want it to print the URL, change the project directory, but I'm just running train.py. And I'm telling it that the, the, the place to put logs is IPTF colon slash slash uh, repo root, which is just my local repo. Um, in the top level directory logs, and then I'm telling it to save the model. So if I, for speed, I'm actually going to tell it to run uh, offline. But if you don't, it up, if the node it starts up is online. And so this is actually running uh, the daemon in process and using a C plus, a, a SWIG based bridge to uh, shuttle data from C++ into Go, et cetera. So this thing is loading pre files. This is the, the, the model running. And in just a moment, we'll see it start doing some uh, tensor, TensorFlow, like normal logging operations. And after it does that, I'll, I'll cancel it, and I'll show you guys the, the other half of this. Um, my computer doesn't handle the Zoom, the Zoom app very well. OK, so you can see TensorFlow started up. And give it another moment. While this is running, are there any questions so far for the things I've described? So you're using a CPU-based training? Uh, yeah, for this demo, this is just TensorFlow, the simplest TensorFlow CPU. I'm, I'm uh, pro, uh, aggressively logging 
the file system operations. It's just to prove that stuff works. This is noise that I've, I've added. So you can see it's adding, uh, these are the, 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 all the files, files that it's writing or appending to, et cetera. The, the API that TensorFlow uses to write to file systems is actually a surprisingly good fit for IPFS. You cannot randomly uh, modify a file. You can only append or create new files. So it's really nice for snapshotting and relatively high performance. So you can see this thing is running. It's running really, really slowly. Um, if this were running on GPU, et cetera, it'd be much faster. Um, if this were running in the cloud, it'd be much, much faster. Okay, so I'll, I'll stop that right there. And I've also, uh, the way that you use uh, TensorFlow is you run your stuff, you log to some directory, and then they have a, a, a server that you run along with a uh, like dashboard that you can use called TensorBoard. And so uh, this does the same exact thing for TensorBoard. Um, in that it, it binds TensorBoard to the same, you guys can still see, correct? Yep. Okay, cool. So yeah, this is TensorBoard running. Actually, no, we can't, uh, actually, sorry. I just see your terminal. You just see the terminal, so you should I see. I see everything. Yeah, yeah I, I, see. I, see. Yeah, I can see it too. This, Might be the connection. Okay. I see. Um, I can try to reduce the visual complexity of, of what you guys are looking at. Maybe. Here we go. Okay, so this is the TensorBoard interface, and if you see down here in the bottom left corner, it might be a bit small. It's reading from the top level IPTF root logs directory, um, and you can see a couple of the test runs I did earlier this morning, um, and you can see that this is the actual training operation. So one of the things that makes this special is um, this is publishing to, an, uh, by default, an IPNS namespace, which means that anybody that runs TensorBoard on their machine can pull logs off of your machine while your model is training. And there's more advanced things you can do. All the things you can do at TensorBoard work with this because it looks just like a normal file system. Um, this is extremely sensitive to high performance. Uh, like, you know, you want to be able to read from these things and uh, as quickly as you possibly can. So uh, one of the big things to do for this is making sure that this is just as, just as a local file system or as close as we can get to it, which is why I'm actually running a daemon in process rather than via the HTTP API, because researchers and folks running in production will just reject uh, something that runs too slowly. So, um, you'd be able to see all the pretty graphs and visuals, et cetera, here, if this were, if were running out a little faster. The last thing I'll show you is that this actually is publishing to the um, IPFS, uh, Overlay network, and if I were to click on uh, logs or save, you'd be able to actually browse the actual logs that were generated by, by this in the normal IPFS network. So, again, this is uh, called IPTF. It's uh, something that a lot of researchers are extremely excited about because of how rough and complex it is to share uh, data sets today. Sort of the best way to get data sets right now is something called the, the best way to get them quickly is something called academic torrents, um, and it's an out-of-band way to download uh, data ahead of time. You still need to unpack, et cetera, and with IPTF, you just read a, you know, a, a particular file deep in a data set, uh, and you'll fetch it just in time to the, to the machine learning workers that are, that are doing the training. So uh, that's the demo that I have. Uh, if there are any questions, I could answer that, or we can talk about stuff. Oh, that's super cool. Way cool. Um, how about just Adam? Uh, can you introduce uh, where you're from and what do you do? I think you're new to the calls. I am. Let me disable my screen sharing because my computer's having difficulty to stop sharing. Um, yeah, so my name is Adam Buengel. I uh, way back when at MIT. I've been out in San Francisco working on startups and programming languages and uh, distributed systems. And I've spent the last year working on building a uh, suite of tools for to people doing machine learning and people trying to apply machine learning to uh, software businesses. So yeah, that's a, that's a 
super high level. Uh, this is a part of a, a, a large uh, comprehensive suite of tools um, for making it possible to just download data sets like you would watch movies on Netflix to be able to download models and apply them just like you would uh, download an app from an app store or uh, a Python uh, library from PyPy. So that's just a bit of background. Hope my audio quality is all right. Yeah, it looks like mine's uh, slowing down too. Does anyone have any questions? I can't see hands right now. I have a question. Uh, Adam, did you say that the, the, you're using IPNS to distribute the, the on the fly, distribute the hashes of, of the data set? So the, the uh, IPTF provides access to both the IPNS and IPFS namespaces. Uh, so data sets will be published using IP, the IPFS uh, hashes for stability because reproducibility is extremely important. But when publishing logs uh, across machines, I'm using IPNS. And so the, the resolution time isn't great. I'm, I'm figuring that off, you know, the rising tide will raise all the boats here for, for some of the work that folks are doing. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so the thing I wonder, and it's good that Jeremy and David are on here, is I wonder if it would actually be worth you looking into using PubSub instead. If, it's, if you have a constrained number of machines who are wanting to follow those updates and that speed of that information propagating is important, it, you might get much better performance if you use PubSub. I might be wrong there. Jeremy, am I right there? Um, I think you are right, Matt. And like one of the things that Vizo is working right now, I don't know if he's just around, is getting IPNS over PubSub. Because essentially IPNS is just like a name service, right? Like you sign um, records with a private key and everyone can validate it with a public key. And that in GoIPFS today on the released version um, works over the DHT. So you publish those records to the DHT and then other peers can like fetch those records. But there is no limitation to like publish those records to PubSub as well. And that is something that I believe Viso is actively working on GoIPFS. Uh, so it, what this means is like soon you will be able to use IPNS and get fast updates across multiple nodes without even to think about if they go through the DHT or if they go through PubSub you can just um, like publish your name as you always would. And if your node is connected, is online, when other nodes are subscribing to that IPNS name, then they will get a faster update because the nodes can find each other and have this direct connection. Um, we also want to ex expose primitives that let you control that. Like you can even disable DHT entirely and like, or disable PubSub entirely or even like have other methods to, to do this uh, content routing. But, but yeah, like work is in progress. So it sounds like, yeah, PubSub would benefit him, but actually you'll kind of get that for free if you just keep using IPNS and wait a little bit. Yeah, okay, so yes, that, exactly. Cool, <laughs> is that something that's in 4.12 or will be in, in after that? Uh, Jeremy will be able to answer that better than uh, Yeah, it's not merged at this point. Uh, it's going to be upcoming. Got it. Uh, okay, yeah, that sounds that sounds that sounds great. I mean, the there are some other things that uh, that are part of uh, TensorFlow that are a fantastic fit for some of the peer-to-peer -peer channels in uh, IPFS, and so I'm looking forward to expanding. Uh, making it possible to sort of uh, uh, elastically grow the cluster of workers working on a problem uh, and doing all that coordination over over IPFS. Um, right now, I just model, if you sync to disk, I publish the IPNS handle. So lower latency updates when you do that would be, they'd be really magical. And a lot of the research community that I've shown this to has been really excited about being able to apply this. So hopefully that's a, a much larger and enthusiastic and well-funded audience for IPFS to benefit from exposure to. Very cool. Very cool. Awesome. Winding down to three minutes left. Uh, does anyone have any other last questions or agenda items? It doesn't sound like it. Uh, so uh, who did the start of the recording today? I, did. I have it. All right, can you save that to the notes? And Kex, can you um, uh, save it to the hackpad? Yep. 
Okay. Alrighty, y'all. <laughs> All right, sweet. Thanks, everyone. Okay. We broke right, our thanks. record. 24 yeah. people. <laughs> That's nice. All right, see you next week. Yeah. Bye.